Well, good morning, good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, welcome to uh, our 08 traditional Protestant uh, service on this. This is the 18th of uh, December, is that right? One week from now, we'll have uh, Christmas Day. One short week. Are you ready? Are you ready for Christmas? I'm not ready. <laughs> I, I, have, uh, I have six more days to, uh, to get ready. But uh, the wonder is, is that uh, Christ has come and he will come. Indeed, Jesus uh, is coming. And uh, what a fine week this is just to, uh, to focus uh, on our Savior. What a wonderful time we have here at 08 to focus on, on our Lord. And we're grateful that Chapman Brooks will be bringing the gospel to us here uh, this morning and at uh, 11 o'clock. Just a couple of uh, short announcements. Uh, immediately following the service, we'll have coffee downstairs. And for those of you who would love to be able to assist us with preparation for our Christmas Eve candlelight service, we are going to be assembling candles downstairs. It'll be a very simple process. If you could build five simple candles and Valerie will show us what we're doing. That would be tremendous preparation as we uh, will have live fire <laughs> on <laughs> Christmas Eve. It'll be dangerous, but uh, we'll trust the Lord with safety on Christmas Eve. And that will be at 1800 on Saturday night, our uh, annual Christmas Eve candlelight service. And then next Sunday on Christmas Day, we will not have a 08 service. We will have one service, one Protestant service here on post. Chapel next and gospel will join us for our 11 o'clock worship hour. So if you come here at 08, you will be able to prepare spiritually for the 11 o'clock worship service. And I think that, uh, I think that is the extent of our announcements uh, here this morning. And so I am Chaplain Tom Fakeney and we look forward to Chaplain Brooks bringing the gospel to us this morning. So uh, brothers and sisters, I invite you to stand as I uh, open in prayer, and then we will uh, sing our opening hymn. Please stand with me for uh, the invocation. Almighty God, we give you praise and honor and glory, for you are our God, and we are your people, and you have uh, created uh, a path of escape for us from uh, judgment that uh, really rightly should have fallen on us but has uh, wonder of wonders fell on your son whom you sent and so we come to you in Jesus name this morning and we ask that uh, you would bless us with eyes to see your glory and hearts that understand your love which is infinite and eternal love that uh, calls us your children because you have placed the name of Jesus on our souls help us to trust in you and to magnify you and glorify you and give us a little bit more of an understanding of your glory that is revealed in the sending of Jesus Christ. I ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us turn in our hymnals to hymn number 391, Sweet, Sweet Spirit.
Holy Spirit, you are uh, sweet. We do adore you, for you have, uh, even now, you are bringing the Lord Jesus to us and lifting our eyes to our Father. And we, uh, we approach with simple, childlike faith, trusting in you, that uh, we would know uh, your sweetness and your glory and your goodness. So indeed, uh, we thank you and we praise you for the ability to worship uh, you together here this morning. Come and be with us. Come, Lord Jesus, come. In Christ's name, amen. Let us continue our worship by turning to hymn number 292, Thou Didst Leave Thy Throne. 292. Before uh, we take our seats, brothers and sisters, let's just turn to one another and uh, greet one another in the name of the Lord Jesus this morning. It is good to be together. It is 
very good. If uh, you are uh, new to our worship service, or if you have a prayer request you would like us as pastors, as your church body, to pray for, we've got little connection cards right there in the pews right in front of you. You can fill that out and complete that. And uh, just place it in the offering plate or hand it to one of our ushers or to one of the pastors uh, following uh, worship, and then uh, we will be sure to, uh, to pray for you or to follow up with you and to keep you connected with what's happening here with our chapel congregation throughout the week and the, indeed the days to come. We now have an opportunity to, uh, to confess uh, to some, some basic Christian truths that uh, the church has held on to for centuries and centuries. A simple summary of gospel truth found in scripture as we recite the Apostles' Creed. I will ask a simple question, brothers and sisters. Uh, what uh, do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. And Catholic here simply meaning universal, the universal church that runs through all time. Let us uh, go to the Lord together as a church family. Uh, I will... Uh, Lead us uh, in, a, in, a, in a time of corporate confession of sin, and there, there will be then an opportunity for just some silent uh, reflection, an opportunity for us personally just to lay our burdens down before the Lord. And then I will uh, declare a simple promise of forgiveness from, uh, from the scriptures as we, clo as we will uh, conclude this opportunity for uh, just hearing a word of assurance at the conclusion of the pastoral prayer. So, brothers and sisters, uh, let us pray together. Heavenly Father, you are the one who is sovereign. You are the one who is in control. You are the one who has all authority as God. And as, as God, you are not absent. Although you are transcendent, and we can't put our hands around you in your vastness, you are incomprehensible. The one who is all-powerful and all-present and all-knowing. The one who is completely pure and good and righteous. Who is holy, holy, holy. Yet you have... Uh, revealed yourself to us. You have made yourself known to us. In creation, we see the fingerprint of your power and these eternal attributes. And we see your presence. And we see your desire to be present with us, your creatures. And what a remarkable thing that is, that you are the God who wants to be near and yet you are the God who reigns above. We realize, Almighty God, that as you reveal yourself to us in your power and your wonder in creation, as you reveal yourself to us in the law that you gave your people Israel, that you've given to us, the simple sum, summation of it there in the Ten Commandments, or just this call to love you with all of our hearts, our souls, our minds, to love you, to love our neighbors, even to love ourselves. Lord, as we think about that standard and that call, we realize that we have failed. We have failed to love you as you really ought to be loved, as you require to be loved, as you love yourself. Heavenly Father, forgive us 
for uh, our transgressions against you. Forgive us for our moral failures and impurities. Forgive us for our deceptions and our, our speaking half-truths or our out-and-out -out lies. Lord, forgive us for following the ways of this world. Lord, forgive us for uh, just succumbing to the temptations of the flesh and the passions of this world. Lord, uh, forgive us for uh, not submitting to you as king and for choosing to do what is right in our own eyes. Forgive us, Almighty God, for sinning against you in, in word, in thought, and in deed. Forgive us uh, as your church for not worshiping you in spirit and in truth as you alone ought to be worshipped, for hearts, Lord, that oftentimes are divided. Almighty God, uh, we ask uh, that you would, uh, in Jesus' name, forgive us. And I pray that, uh, Holy Spirit, that you would come and that you would uh, speak to us personally where we are at, that you would be present within our very souls here in this moment and reveal to us where we have... Uh, sinned against you, sinned against ourselves, sinned against our spouses or our family, friends, those we work with, our neighbors. Uh, Holy Spirit, come, and in the quiet, I pray that you would reveal to us what we need to confess and enable us in the quiet to confess it to you. Now hear this wonderful promise, uh, brothers and sisters, from the Gospel of John. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him, our Lord Jesus. Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. We are declared righteous because of his faithfulness. Almighty God, we thank you for this gift of salvation, for washing away our guilt and placing on us uh, the righteousness and the perfect obedience of your Son. And in this one who shed his blood on Calvary's cross, our guilt would be washed away, and that in his resurrection we would be clothed with righteousness that establishes us as holy in your sight, all of it the gift of faith, none of it earned by our works, but all of it uh, the wonder of uh, the work and ministry and the perfection of your Son. We thank you, Almighty God, in Christ's name. Amen. I invite the ushers to come forward to receive this morning's uh, tithes and offerings. I really do thank God for the generosity of uh, this congregation making uh, ministry uh, happen here on post. And uh, one of the things we've been able to do is a uh, holiday Christmas helping hand and uh, assisting soldiers here on post with uh, simple commissary gift cards for themselves and for their family members uh, this Christmas season. And that has been your generosity that's made that happen. Let us uh, give thanks to God for uh, his goodness to us in this offering. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all the gifts you've given to us, for th you, the greatest gift. And we want to give back to you a simple portion of all of your blessings towards us as a simple token of our affection and of our worship of you. In uh, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, take these gifts and use them for extending your glory and your peace here on Fort Boilthor and around the world. Amen.
Let's stand for the doxology. morning again. Today we light the fourth Advent candle. It represents peace and is called the angel's candle. As the Apostle Luke uh, reports about the birth, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory be to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol, or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, it is too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil or choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. Next readings from Romans chapter 1, verse 1 through 7. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God, in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom he have received grace and apostleship to bring from the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations, including you who are called belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you for sending your, th your son, the Prince of Peace, May his peace reign among all nations, within all families, and in all hearts throughout the whole universe. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Good morning, congregation. It is good to be with you this morning. This day marks the fourth Sunday of Advent, and as our bulletin indicates, the cover, you can see 
the theme there, even though the theme is peace, you can see at Chaplain Fakeman's urging that the bulletin is printed with the theme of love. Chaplain Fakeman's point was that with love, with peace, that brings upon love. So that just happened to coincide with the passage that I've been thinking about for a while as the Lord leads. And it's from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 22, which describes love from our Lord's point of view. It is simply titled, The Greatest Commandment. It goes, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with the question, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Jesus continued, this is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets, which is the entire Old Testament, hang upon these two commandments. Again, verse 39. Love uh, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. It is in the spirit of both the greatest commandment and particularly the second that we offer our intercessions, that is, prayer for others, related to that commandment, prayer for our neighbors out of our love for them. And it's for our petitions and our supplications to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray. And praise the Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning knowing your word, that you make perpetual intercession. For your word tells us that you always live to intercede for us, that you are our advocate, the great mediator between us and God. We thank you that through your name we can utterly pray boldly and confidently before you. To simply tell you, O oh Lord, our ultimate intercessor, of our pleadings for those who are in great and pressing need of your mercy, of your grace, and of your love. By these prayers, release the powers of your providence and your blessing upon us and them, O oh Lord. We lift up to you the people of our nation, those in our neighborhoods, in our cities and towns, and in this chapel's community. Begin with those who follow you and help them and help them influence others for good, for salvation, for your good. Let them be salt and light, pointing others to you. Raise up, Lord, godly leaders 
both military and civilian, who will serve you faithfully at all costs. Give them your mind and surround them with godly counselors who will exercise integrity and work for justice, morality, and freedom. Help them to esteem you and not dismiss you. Send your comfort, your peace, and your calming presence, especially those who are out or who are without hope. Heal the sick. Comfort those who are bereaved. Protect the defenseless and hold them to your heart. We pray for laborers to tell the good news of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to people around the world. Send revival, Lord, in your name. These things we pray and believe. Amen. And let us recite the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And amen. And please have a blessed and Merry Christmas. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Tumor family. <sighs> Brothers and sisters, I invite you to stand and uh, let us sing hymn number 272. And uh, let us sing verses 1, 3, and 5 this morning of While Shepherds Watched Their Flocks. <coughs> 1, 3, and 5. Amen. Please be seated. Chapman Brooks, uh, this is uh, his first time preaching to us here as a congregation. I thank the Lord for the gifts he gives. Thomas is one of them. Him and his fantastic wife, Maribel, and their son have been with us for a few months, and he is our Defense Logistics Agency chaplain and a recently promoted uh, 06. So this is his first time preaching to us, and I think it's your first time preaching as a newly minted 
06 chaplain. So Same let's, gospel. Uh, <laughs> so let's, let's just give him a simple round of applause <laughs> okay. for the promotion. And uh, we welcome you, brother, to minister the gospel to us. Thank you. Good morning. If you could turn to Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 55. Uh, you know, we come to these very familiar passages. And, of course, just as we read in the confession today, um, we will preach on these very same topics. Uh, we should pray when we come to a very familiar passage that the Holy Spirit would bring us fresh eyes and fresh encouragement and, uh, every time we come. Just preceding our text, the angel Gabriel revealed surprising news to the young virgin Mary. Mary, you have found grace with God. You will conceive a son and call him Jesus. This great son of the Most High will be given the Davidic throne who will reign over his kingdom eternally. And all this without the involvement of a man, but the Holy Spirit you will, um, but by the Holy Spirit you will miraculously conceive. And your relative Elizabeth, barren and old, has conceived a son and is six months along in her pregnancy. And Mary humbly submits to this revelation and mission from God. And that brings us to our reading in Luke 1.39. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this grand to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. So Mary, within days of her miraculous conception, visits Elizabeth, setting off an explosive chain of spirit-filled and spirit-led joy, centered upon the prophetic word and the special person in their presence. Mary greets Elizabeth hears. The unborn John leaps. The Spirit fills Elizabeth and she joyfully proclaims the blessedness of Mary, the blessedness of the unborn Jesus, her Lord, and the blessedness of Mary's faith in God's revealed word. As we see later with Mary's song, the prophetic declarations of Elizabeth and the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies brought deep joy to Mary. Ever since Genesis 3, God had promised that a woman would bear a son that would ultimately destroy the work of the devil and deal with humanity's sin problem. Thousands of years have culminated in this Christmas story and the coming of Jesus. Verse 32, the Son of the Most High. Verse 35, the one called Holy, the Son of God. Now, without going into all the details here, we see the Incarnation. God made flesh. The Son in Mary was human, and yet Son of God in its unique sense. God's eternal Son and member of the Trinity. Hum humanly born, the seed of the woman, yet in fact, the great and eternal I Am. Eternal creator and sustainer, the radiance of the glory of God, one substance with the Father, fully God and fully man. Take to heart who and what 
he is and let your heart expand in love and wonder. This God of the universe allowed himself to be conceived and to dwell most vulnerably in the liquid darkness of Mary's womb. And that's just the beginning of the story that led all of the way to his sacrifice on the cross, a sacrifice only he could effectively make to our salvation because of his unique person found here. How do we respond to these glorious realities? The example for us is given by Mary in her response. The answer, we are to glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's evident that Mary absorbed these truths into the depths of her heart, and she responds in rapturous praise and worship. Her hymn begins in verses 46 to 47, and Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. God is the object of her worship and adoration, and she wholeheartedly attributes greatness to him for what he has done for her specifically and for all of God's people. Clearly, Mary's heart and mind were saturated with God's word as more than a dozen Old Testament passages are integrated into her song. God richly used the word sown in her heart to bear fruit to a passion for him, praise for him, and a song to stir the hearts of God's people for ages. Her words lift up and display God's character and works and are soaked to the brim with authentic joy. She models for us the chief end of humankind, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Despite our ever-changing circumstances, our God stays the same and our joy remains rooted in him. His promises and the glorious things we have in him that are sure and certain. Now, how can these great things be? To whom do they belong? We see in this passage and throughout the Bible that lowliness is a, is a prerequisite for great things. Now, lowliness of status characterized Mary, but of course that sort of lowliness is not an absolute prerequisite for God's working great things through a person, though more often than not, he delights to work in that way. As we're reminded of in 1 Corinthians 1, where we read that God often chooses the weak, the low and despised, so that all the glory goes to him. When the narrative begins, Mary was what people might consider a nobody. Certainly, she possessed no power, extremely little money, and no fame. Yet God chose her. And she would be mildly used to do what womankind had been destined to do through God since the fall of humankind to sin. She would bear the Savior, the one who would save us from our sins and the terrible consequence of alienation from God. God loves to use the downtrodden and those whom society leaves behind. But there's another sense of lowliness that absolutely is the prerequisite of the greatest thing that can ever happen to us, of being made right in our relationship with God. We need a heart lowliness. Mary possesses too, as is evident by her words and actions here and elsewhere. Mary knew her holy God, who he was and who she was, in relation to him, a sinner. She needed a savior, verse 47, and her view of herself is as God views all of us, as spiritually poor, needy, and utterly dependent upon him for help. Luke 1, for he has looked upon the humble state of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. God did not owe her or any of us anything but judgment and condemnation. We come to God with self-poverty as we see ourselves as we are before him unworthy. 
We can do nothing to earn or to merit favor from God. Instead, we deserve death and hell. But fear not. Through this child Jesus, we have a way to have the record of our sins wiped away and to have a record of perfect righteousness placed on our account. Thank God this gospel is for you and is for me. We who by his spirit recognize ourselves to be spiritually poor and spiritually hungry as Christ gives in his Beatitudes in Luke 6. And Christ became poor so that we could become rich, rich toward God. He chose to become a tiny speck in the womb of Mary. He chose to be born a man and to be born into a lowly family, to a lowly young lady, to be born in a manger, to be taken away to Egypt to avoid the murderous Herod, to grow up in poverty in the despised city of Nazareth, to teach and be rejected, though he did the Father's work as attested with many miracles, to die on that cross with great agony, enduring the wrath due our sins placed upon him, to die, to be buried, to rise again. He started low on this earth and walked down and down and down all of the way to the cross unto great physical suffering and much greater spiritual agony. He, as second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God, came to serve. Humility of heart before God. Let's consider the opposite as Mary does. We learn that God brings down the proud. Luke 151, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. This, of course, is a stern warning to those who are proud. It's also a comfort to God's people who in history have been targeted, oppressed, persecuted, and even martyred by the proud. Mary would have an ever present reminder with Roman occupiers of her land. And biblical history is full of examples of prideful nations, leaders, and individuals. To name a few, remember Pharaoh of Egypt who would not willingly release God's people from slavery. Goliath, Absalom, Haman, Belshazzar, And King Nebuchadnezzar, the mighty king of the mighty empire of Babylon, strutting, arrogant, conceited, full of himself, his pride was setting himself up for a very great fall. He was warned by God in dreams, yet in his heart, devoured with pride, spoke words of great haughtiness and self-importance, and God struck him down with the madness that drove him to eat grass like a wild animal. When God restored his reasoning, his heart had been changed, and he gives a powerful statement of God's sovereignty and ends it with, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Mary knew that God works in this way. Those who seem to hold all the cards, all the power, do not. God's plan and purposes will prevail. Take heart, children of God. And beware any person who is held captive to the sin of pride. The humble worship God. The proud worship themselves. The humble receive mercy and forgiveness. The proud receive condemnation and justice. In relation to God, the proud are self-sufficient, self satisfied, self-glorifying, and self-willed against God's will, defiant. Yet hear God's word in James 4, 6, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God will bring you down from your throne. Submit to the Son. Take refuge in Him. Jesus will serve as your King for all of eternity. Next, Mary centers on God's glorious attributes. Meditate with her on our powerful, 
holy and merciful God. This is the heart of humble worship. In Mary's song, she glorifies the Lord for his power, his holiness, and his mercy. Verse 51 speaks of God's strength. In that case, to scatter the proud. And it's also used to miraculously enable Elizabeth to conceive even in her old age. And even more wondrously, that power enables Mary as a virgin to conceive. Our God is almighty. The same God who created humankind, the animals, vegetation, the sun, moon, and stars, this God, our God, has no problem whatsoever with the virgin conception in Mary. As Gabriel said, for nothing is impossible with God. Our God is powerful. Our God is holy. Luke 149, holy is his name. His name, his character, his reputation is holy. He is separate, set apart. He is above all creatures and certainly above all their weaknesses to include humankind's sin. He hates sin. When it comes to sin, he is a consuming fire. He is morally perfect and completely righteous. What makes the world as it currently stands, is the entrance of sin into the world when humanity rebelled against God and went our own way. All of that is ugly, painful, unjust, and sad that you see today is a result of unholiness. We on the other hand, are currently being a salt and light to the world and are eagerly awaiting for the fulfillment of God's promise, 2 Peter 3.13, a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And as in Revelation 21, when there will be no more sin, a perfect relationship with God, no more sadness, death, or pain. Powerful, holy, merciful, our God is merciful, Luke 1.50, and his mercy is for those who fear him. Mercy is God's loyal love. Think of the Old Testament hesed, the faithful and gracious love. Psalm 103 is a good example of this, using the phrase steadfast love multiple times in translation as well as the word compassion. The ultimate expression of this for us is salvation from our sin and all of sin's eternal consequences. That's exactly why Jesus the Christ came to deal with our guilt and sin before God. God's mercy stems from his character and specifically his faithfulness to his covenant to those who know him. Do you understand yourself to be helpless in satisfying the perfect requirements of righteousness? Do you recognize that you have no right to favorable treatment based on your own merits. Thank God there is one who has merited favor for those who are powerless to save themselves. And may our reception of God's mercy provoke us to the highest worship of our wonderful God. Now we've seen some of the attributes of God, ones that Mary had specifically magnified his name for, power, holiness, and mercy. But our God is not abstract. How are we to relate to him? How are we to personally know him? We need a transformed relationship with God to fear him. As we see in these passages, Mary had a deep relationship with her God. It had transformed her heart and life. This is evident from her words and actions in all of Luke 1. She uses one word that may seem odd to us, but it's not odd when it's considered how it's used throughout the Bible and in how of it's intended. Fear. Luke 1 50, and his mercy to those who fear him. Fearing God, pious reverence, all in wonder at who he is. No doubt you're familiar with verses like this. Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. 
As is common in Hebrew poetry and wisdom literature, you have one phrase that parallels another. It's just phrased slightly differently. The first phrase, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, is equivalent to the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. To fear the Lord means to have a relational knowledge of Him. And this knowledge of Him, this personal knowledge, compels us to cherish reverence, respect, and honor for Him. It shapes our whole heart and life, and such reverential fear compels us to lovingly avoid what is contrary to his will, sin, and instead to seek to please him. It entails belief in his word, belief in his promises, and obedience to his commands. All of this, of course, is impossible without the transformational work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. God takes the initiative. God illumines our minds. He opens our spiritual eyes. This is what is as described by Jesus in John 3 when Jesus told Nicodemus that he needed to be born again to gain entrance into the kingdom of God. Mary's heart had been transformed. This is why you see a joyful submission to God to be an instrument in his hand. And she knew full well it would cost her That was obvious from the beginning. I mean, who would believe a crazy story about an angel from a teenage young lady who found herself pregnant? She anticipated grave rejection and ridicule. And if we glance at her life to come, we discover that she indeed experienced hardship and heartache, not because she was outside of God's will, but precisely because she was in it. Think of what she experienced a complicated childbirth after traveling and not finding a regular place to stay. Simeon's child dedication of Jesus that said a sword would pierce her soul. A need to flee the country and become a refugee in order to avoid the murderous intentions of Herod. The torture, crucifixion, and death of her son. So it's not all roses, but God had a purpose and plan that was far, far greater than any of these and would resound to eternal glory and joy. She sacrificed and suffered, and so may we. Yet Jesus went far further. Mary said in Luke 138, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Jesus said something very similar in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Luke 22, 42, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. What Jesus paid costs infinitely more than we will ever suffer or could even imagine. And we will never, ever outgive Jesus. His love for us melts and motivates us to love and to serve and to grow in sanctification throughout our Christian lives. God can and will transform you if you fear Him, if you savingly know Him and use the means of grace and the knowledge of His love to continue to grow in sanctification and devotion. Our next highlight in Mary's song, we remember that we are to enjoy God forever. Are you spiritually hungry? God gives ultimate satisfaction. Luke 153 has filled the hungry with good things and the rich He has sent away empty. This reminds us of the beatitude in Luke 6, 21. Blessed are you who hungry are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Are you hungry? Spiritually hungry? Do you feel your need for God? Do you long to have the void in your heart and life filled? Are you aware of your own spiritual bankruptcy before God? Do you, like the psalmist, thirst for God? Psalm 42, 1. As the deer pants for flowing streams... So pants my soul for you, O God. There is no other food, there is no other drink that will satisfy like our God. Come to him for mercy. The rich, those who are full of themselves, do not enter the kingdom of God. Paradoxically, the rich go away hungry. In Luke 18, the rich ruler comes to Jesus verbally asking him for eternal life. But he walked away empty, because his heart was already packed with his earthly treasure and had no room for the greatest treasure of all found in Jesus. 
Are you rich in one way or another, completely stuffed in your heart, independent, consumed with material possessions and the desire for them, bloated with personal accomplishments, seeking ultimate fulfillment in a relationship, attempting to stuff the soul, holes in your soul that only God can fill, consumed with power or position, things that in themselves could be humbly received as God's good gifts, yet a stuffed heart has turned them into idols and made them ends in themselves. Unless you repent, you'll walk away empty, hollow, and worse than that, under judgment, alienated from God forever. Yet, if you hunger and thirst for God, by His grace you will be filled. Jesus says in John 4, 14, But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So instead of being hollow and empty, you'll be satisfied in ultimate ways. Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Satisfied that the problem of their guilt is taken care of and that they have through Christ, receive full forgiveness. Satisfied with a personal knowledge of and relationship with God. Satisfied with life, true life, full life, eternal life. Spiritual hunger and ultimate satisfaction. And finally, Mary sings of God's sure word in his everlasting covenant. Luke 155, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Now, I can't go into depth with this, uh, because of time, but the bottom line here is that God was fulfilling his covenant with Abraham. And he will always fulfill every one of his promises to us. His purposes are irresistible and unchangeable. No authority on earth can overcome him, and we see in the book of Revelation that at the end of times, Jesus will fully manifest his rulership <clears throat> in the new heavens, and the new earth as King of kings and Lord of lords, a perfect king who has conquered sin and death. The Lord our God is mighty to save. He will rescue us in every way conceivable. Praise be to God, the keeper of promises. Glorify him and enjoy him forever. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, seal these words to our hearts and lives. May they bear fruit in, in love towards you, in peace, and in joy. It's in your blessed name we ask. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain Brooks. Okay, brothers and sisters, uh, we have to stand and sing this closing hymn. I was going to cut it out, but I can't. Please stand and let us sing uh, hymn number 277. Hark the herald angels sing.
invite you to join us for coffee downstairs and assembling some candles for our Christmas Eve service Saturday at 1800. Brothers and sisters, now receive this benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen and amen.